So welcome to Moonshot Education. All right, let's see how we're going to do this today. As I said, it's my first time doing this, so I don't know exactly how it works, but we're going to do it together. Um, so how many people here are familiar with the concept of Moonshot? Not you guys. OK, great. So then I can give you some information. I can impart some knowledge as I'm learning. So um, in 1962, President John, John F. Kennedy gave a speech at Rice University where he delivered these words. He said, we choose to go to the moon in this decade. And that planted the seed to align an entire country to go to the moon. And it was very interesting because we can say that JFK did not set a goal by knowing he, that we would achieve to go to the moon. He simply said, we're going to do it. An entire country went behind the goal. And it was humo it's a humongous goal for humanity at the time. He just said, we're going to do it. This is it. And so Moonshot became sort of a... Um, a way of describing how we're going to solve big, big, big problems. So let's say right now, what could be moonshot climate change? You know, someone saying that we're going to solve 10 times faster, um, you know, how to solve climate change. We're not going to worry about um, all the little details that could, um, uh, you know, inhibit us from scaling at that, at that, um, uh, that way. So 50 years later, Astro Teller has taken the discourse of the moonshot into a philosophy, this mindset. Um, so Teller, for those that don't know, is the director of X, who is that's formerly Google X. And um, it's Google's disruptive innovation division where they ideate, test, and launch projects that use cutting edge technologies to build solutions that can radically improve the world. So these big, 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 humongous ideas. Um, so, and they call themselves the Moonshot Factory. So in a way, Moonshot thinking, which is what we're going to discuss today, is when you choose a humongous problem and propose to create a radical solution using a disruptive technology. And, and it could be technology, but it could be a just disruptive thinking in general. And um, the idea is that there are no limitations to what we can achieve as a society through this kind of thinking. And so if I put our minds to it, we can literally go to the moon or in our generation to Mars. So I guess moonshot still sounds better than Mars shot, right? So how do we reset our operating system and redefine education for 21st century through the moonshot thinking? And that's what we're going to talk about today. So to solve something, we also have to figure out, well, what the problem really is. So we are going to discuss today how to solve education's three of education's biggest or toughest challenges. And those are the way we have uh, sort of defined them. First is an outdated model in learning. It's a bit, the education today, what we're doing is we're teaching children in 19th century buildings most of the time, unless you're in Qatar, where it's really 21st century, but most of the world is 19th century buildings using 20th century tools to teach them 21st century skills. So it's not really working. Right now, what we're doing is we're stuffing information on children's heads when we're out, what we're needed to do is elicit knowledge, elicit learning. The second big one is the skills gap. How many people have heard about the skills gap? OK, great. So I don't really need to explain it. It's, it's really the, the discussion here is really about the fact that we're not churning enough skill, skilled em employees or skilled people to, for the demands of the 21st century workforce. And the 21st century workforce and employer is changing dramatically, so much so that by 2030, um, about 60% of the jobs that we now know or the industries are not even going to exist. So what do we tell my kids who are graduating in, uh, in high school at that time? What do we tell them what jobs are going to do? So, and the third one, I would say, incredibly important that sort of uh, touches all of these issues sort of equally is inequality or inequity. Um, and I'm sure you've heard sort of the moniker, talent is universal, but opportunity is not. We know that. Uh, we have, in this conference alone, you've probably heard about uh, deep learning, um, 
blended learning, personalized learning, student-centered learning. There's maybe hundreds of learning-based activities and, and uh, ideas out there. There's probably hundreds of philanthropic investments and opportunities to fund them. And yet, we're still not able to solve for inequity, which, you know, there's plenty of those in terms of race, discrimination, access, uh, the tech divide, all sorts of different things. So for as many solutions that we have, we have as many inequity problems. So how do we solve for those? Um, and those are pretty pers persisting. So what we're going to do today, um, so this is sort of like my quick spiel about the what we're dealing with, and it's really just touching, it's the tip of the iceberg. Obviously, around the conference today, you've learned that there's so many other deeper problems. What we're going to do today is time travel. We're going to go to the year 2050, and we're going to say not what is, but what if, and, and basically imagine what what would moonshot education look like? What it would look like if we went to the moon by 2050 and we fixed all these problems? And these are the people that are joining me today are the people who are actually imagining that future with me. So I'm going to introduce them real quick. And you'll notice that they're all really, really friendly with each other because they're all buddies. <laughs> um, so we're going to start with Janet Raffner, the Director of Learning at Science at Home and Center for Hybrid Intelligence at Aarhus University in Denmark. And Janet's current research includes theoretical and pheno phenomenological turbulence. That's a mouthful. Uh, creativity, citizen science, human-to-computer interfaces, and research-enabling game-based education. And then I'm going to invite Manjula. Manjula is an investment banker turned social entrepreneur. He's the founder of Educate Lanka, a nonprofit social enterprise with the mission of democratizing opportunities for all through enhanced access to quality education and learning. And then I'm going to invite Chris Purifoy, the co founder of Learning Economy, a protocol designed to measurably solve the skills gap. So I guess we know what you're going to talk about. <laughs> And the CEO, he's also the CEO of WeLibrary, a platform aimed at re-energizing healthy civic discourse and pioneering social library algorithms that favor good ideas and critical thinking over sensationalism. And I said the best for last. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Jackson Smith um, is co-founder and the CTO of Learning Economy. And Jackson has built augmented reality applications for street workers to see beneath the ground inventory control system for satellites to safely reach the stars. So I guess he knows all about Moonshot. Um, and algorithms for insurance companies to quantify the value of preventative healthcare. And I, and I meant, I'd say, the le I love these guys equally <laughs> and, and what they're doing. So I'm going to jump right in. And again, forgive me, this is a new format for me. So I'm going to try to put on my, my headset in a minute as well. Um, but I would like to start with asking each panelist what their moonshot, what, what is this, moon? they've all traveled to the future and so they all operate under the uh, what if, not what is uh, moniker. So what, is, what does the future look like according to what you guys are doing? So we, we'll start from that side and come back this way. Can you hear me? So yeah, talking about you know what's coming in education. You know, I, I see a future where we can really start to understand you know causally how learning works. You know, at a sort of at, at not at the moment we have sort of a correlative understanding of you know when a student is exposed to a certain sort of pedagogy or a certain sort of curriculum, they tend to develop certain sorts of abilities, certain sorts of values sort of get inculcated you know, inside of them. The problem is, is that you know, when it comes to education, you know, especially educational systems, it's largely uh, guesswork. Um, and so I think what we're on the cusp of is actually getting to the core of what works in education and what doesn't work with respect to our goals. And so I hope by you know, 2050, and you know, this is the world that we're all helping to build, we can focus on what is the purpose of education. And we're not stuck sort of with the mechanics of it. 
you know, we're not stuck trying to figure out, you know, does this work or does this work? We're stuck debating what is the purpose of education, and we have the pieces and the Lego building blocks to construct that world that we want to be living in. Chris. Uh, hi. Hi. It works. Oh, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, yeah, you know, when I think about the future of education, I, I like to think about what if we could quantify the value of education, right? This is an interesting question. And then you have to ask yourself, well, if we can, should we, right? And what are the unintended consequences? But what are the opportunities? And, and what would this mean? You know, uh, you know, when you think about other markets and other industries, when you can quantify the value of a home or a house, you can get equity out of it. You can get liquidity out of it, and you can build an entire market on top of it, right? Uh, a market that is incredibly robust, that creates an economy where uh, every dollar is worth a hundred or a thousand or a million dollars, and you can begin to create uh, an equity pool where everyone can have shared value. Uh, you know, I, you know, I see a future in education where we learn to quantify the value of every influencer in the life of a student, and we begin to quantify the value of skills as assets. No different than a home or a house. And in doing so, we can build a market economy on top of it where we can pay individuals uh, for adding value to that market. And we can pay students to learn, right? Imagine refugees who find themselves in foreign lands who can learn languages uh, to earn money to move out of refugee camps and find a life of their own, right? Or individuals who have grown old and they don't have retirement funds who can learn new skills and retrain for the world and be able to live without, you know, um, like falling into poverty. And I, I really think there's a correlation between the value of education and uh, the quantifiable ability to, um, to have a livable wage. And Manjula. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so with my work in Sri Lanka, uh, with uh, the vision of democratizing opportunities for all, uh, my take on Moonshot for Education is to envision uh, a future, a 2050, where education would become inclusive, which means for everyone, equitable. That means the quality of education would be the same across the board, where the, regardless of where you're from or where your circumstances are. And one is relevant, which means that the education is not geared towards just a degree or for academics, not just for a work or job, but for life. Um, you know, Brookings has this uh, research uh, where by 2030, less than 10 years, uh, or almost 10 years from now, uh, we are going to have 825 million young people without secondary skills. That's nearly 1 billion people in the world without secondary skills. So, and then on another hand, we have 200 million or 250 million out of school without being able to read or write today. So my fear is that when we moonshot for education in 2050, if we cannot bring and if we cannot leapfrog those inequalities to bring these people, bring this part of the population into the education that we are going to provide in an equitable, inclusive and relevant way, that's what I don't want to see. So when we moonshot for education, I want it to be, I want it to be equitable, inclusive and relevant so that uh, education would become meaningful, not just for a job, but for life and for everyone. And Janet, what's your vision for 2050? So my vision uh, really comes down to, uh, to one factor, where we are no longer simply valuing what we can assess, but rather we're assessing what we value. And in my research, I study what's called hybrid intelligence, where I use citizen science games to map the boundary between human and artificial intelligence. And I see in this future uh, a world where we have these optimal synergies between the algorithmic power and the intuitive and empathetic human skills. And with our learners, we're able to create hyper-personalized methodologies that tap in to those unique human skills and adapt to not just a individual circumstance, but to their underlying cognitive makeup. 
So I'm going to ask everyone here today to think about your moonshot. I highlighted three big problems in education. And I'm sorry I'm standing because I wanted to talk to you directly. Um, I highlighted three big problems, but there are obviously other major problems, and there's nuances to those problems as well. So I want you to think about what your moonshot would be. And let's discuss about that later in the panel, you know, later when we have our 10, 15 minutes um, for the Q&A. So I'd love to, to hear more. I think we have a, an intimate enough group where we could have that conversation, more like a round table. So I guess my, my first question will go to Manjula. As I, as I discussed earlier in, in my introduction, it's not for lack of tr trying. There's uh, lots of hundreds of great initiatives, and there's hundreds of opportunities, there's financing. What's actually missing? Why can't we achieve inequity? Where, where are we do, what are we doing wrong? Like how, do you, how do you see that we could get to the moonshot by 2050? How do we fix this? Well, one thing we know is uh, whatever we are doing today is not working. Um, it's going to take Brookings as another study where if we continue with this current approach and the status quo, it'll take 100 years for us to bring the ones we've left behind to the stage of today. So if we continue with the current approach, we're never going to get there. So that means, that means we are going to need a completely disruptive new approach in getting there. And that's not going to be the responsibility of just one stakeholder or one party or one model. It has to be first a collaborative initiative where education has historically been the responsibility of the government uh, or the state, and that hasn't really worked. So we're going to need state, private sector, civil society, researchers, international community coming together in creating these innovative ways to tackle this. And the second, I believe that technology has to play a part in this not as a solution, but as an enabler. Mm -hmm. Because we all know that technology is, is a key factor that's going to disrupt a lot of the industries and sectors in the world, and education has to be one of them. But technology in it itself will not get there. Just giving tablets or uh, laptops to children will not make them learn. So we need uh, technology to be integrated with the policymakers, the visionaries, and then the community players who would implement that, and the private sector who are the recipient who have the, who have the resources to come together in integrating technology as an enabler. And the third one, to make sure whatever the interventions that we do are equitable, inclusive, and relevant. Because what we've seen is, we've, I'll give a perfect example from my country, Sri Lanka. We have a universal education system. So we have 100% primary enrollment rates and 95% literacy rate. So it's a model that was in intended for well, and it, it served a purpose. But today we are seeing 50% of our students graduating secondary level education without job skills. And over the last 70 years since independence, we've been in a war for 30 years. And every 10 years we would, have, we would see violence. So while they might be learning for their degrees or even jobs, they're not learning to live in a peaceful harmony, a peaceful society uh, in, in a diverse environment with respect, empathy, and, and global, global consciousness. So uh, we are going to need a new approach where all these three things are taken into consideration. And I, th that's how I think we're going to reach uh, that moonshot in 2050. So you bring up a really good point um, that we have to figure out a way to bring all of these um, initiatives and people doing all of these great things together and coordinate. So how feasible is coordination in this day and age? And maybe Chris, you can help us a little bit because we think of coordination in the process of we have to centralize things, we have to bring people and things together but that has not exactly worked, and it's, it's, not, it's what the UN has been trying to do, multilateral organizations, people with good intentions. So are we thinking of this the right way? Are we thinking coordination the right way? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think this is one of our major challenges today, uh, and not just uh, with education, but in every industry. You know, I mean, 
Uh, for the last several years, whether we're sitting at the UN or at other places, the major uh, problem you face, no matter what session you're in, for what SDG you're facing, is how do we coordinate better, right? Everyone wants to work together, no one knows how to work together. The reason is because there's a lot of friction when it comes to private, public, academic partnerships, because every partnership requires a very long process where you have to meet and you have to court and you have to get to know each other and you have to trust each other. And this always will leave room for fragmentation, right? Even if you can find ways to coordinate, it's still going to be silos of coordination. And what happens is you end up having a lot of the same work being done by a lot of different people where they could have been working together. Instead, they are working separately. Uh, you know, this stretches what could be a great solution among, you know, lots of different individuals and no one quite gets to the end of it. So this is definitely a massive problem. Uh, and what we have found in education specifically, you know, at Learning Economy, our work is, you know, our, our nonprofit is very much dedicated to uh, unifying the supply chain of education. Right, this is a really new term, supply chain and education. Uh, in, in other industries, it's the backbone of how the industry operates. You know, a supply chain is how distribution works, it's how you coordinate, it's how you build industry and models. Uh, it, it very much stands as the infrastructure, if you will, that the whole industry can function on. Uh, with education, we believe it's the same. Uh, it's just been missed. And today, uh, the supply chain of education is remarkably fragmented. Right, um, school systems don't speak with other school systems, and you know, employer systems don't speak with other employer systems. They definitely, need to, employer systems don't speak with school systems. Credential systems don't speak with each other. You know, government systems don't. I mean, it's every single system is its own system, and this really represents this fragmentation. I think is at the root of in my opinion, all of our problems. You know, this fragmentation is why we have skills gaps because human capital investors like governments and institutions who are trying to invest in education have no data. They don't know what's happening. You know, they only have old and bad data and they don't actually see the holistic approach of education to work. Uh, this is also where opportunity gaps come from, right? Because we just don't know. It's a lack of data. Uh, and so, how do we solve this? You know, let's look to the future. You know, we are developing, and others are as well, uh, protocols for the supply chain, to, to take that supply chain and turn it into a value chain, right? Instead of how it is now, where the only way to map through that supply chain is relationships, you know, who do you know? And the only way to transfer information across that supply chain is a resume or a student record that a lot of times is a piece of paper that's stamped and mailed, right? Uh, this is incredibly inefficient, as you were saying. I mean, it's 21st century, but we're using 19th century modes to do this, and it just, it makes no sense. And so, what, uh, if, if we could create value chains, uh, you know, we're working uh, with organizations like IBM and organizations like Salesforce and others who are working really hard to create protocols that can connect that supply chain into a unified infrastructure, a decentralized but unified infrastructure. And this word decentralized is also pretty new, but it's really important because uh, this idea of coordinating uh, and it being very difficult to coordinate, uh, this happens because of centralization, right? Everyone's trying to centralize their efforts. If we could create protocols that empower everyone in the supply chain to connect to an infrastructure, uh, a good way to think about this is the internet. You know, imagine an internet of education, right? We can all connect to the internet through a browser. We didn't have to spend a lot of time figuring that out. I can communicate with you and share information with you and you and you, and we can do that through a browser without having to put much a time or thought into it. It just works. It's an infrastructure that empowers that. And so, so, so very specifically, uh, if we could connect that infrastructure so that a researcher, right, who works at an institute, who creates research, uh, some of which is cited into curriculums that become pedagogies, that schools adopt, uh, that, they use, that teachers use to teach, that students earn skills and go on to get credentials and degrees and then uh, go on to get jobs and get advances and promotions. If we could have all of this information and data in a safe way where we could share it into a skills graph that anonymizes the data, that makes it, uh, you know, that is safe for the students and, and for the employers, we can begin to coordinate in a way that we never have before. We can start to quantify the value amongst each other. We can start to share information. And human capital investors can quantify and say, here's where our skills are, here's where our skills are missing, and here's how we can measurably solve these gaps. So, so I, I actually think coordination comes from new infrastructures uh, that acts as a plumbing 
that doesn't require anyone to change what they're doing, but that they can connect their systems to a new internet of education. So you talked about data, and you and that's very interesting. Obviously, you know we work in institutions, and we've now managed to accumulate a lot of data. We've heard about data in the past decade as the new oil or the new gold, and all of this interesting stuff uh, that you may or may not believe actually. Um, and we also talk about algorithms, and so. How much of this, uh, Janet, um, is information that can help us make better assessments and better decisions? And for you, I'm specifically interested, you know, we, we, we in some way have figured out how to assess um, hard skills, for example, but when it comes to, you know, and I hate the words soft and hard skills, or 21st century skills, or social emotional learning, the kinds of things that we don't, typically measure or assess, are those the kinds of things we can do? Or, and if yes, how does are there technological advancements that we're using right now? What, what, is, how, what does your work inform you in terms of um, these kinds of? So um, there, there are a couple things that I want to unpack with that. Uh, the first is this discussion uh, that Chris mentioned about uh, that we have so much data. Well, it's not just about the quantity, it's about the quality of the data. and. Uh, right now, we have uh, a lot of data about certain types of people and how certain types of people behave, but one of the biggest issues is having a robust, understandable data set, uh, not to uh, have a data-driven approach, often like Google does or, or Facebook. Uh, they have a model where they think uh, AI first, more data is better, but rather a model-driven approach where we can understand uh, problem solving um, and uh, con contextualization based on a smaller set of data. And I also want to touch on data and diversity because Right now, most of the data that we are using comes from the Western world. It comes from these uh, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and dem democratic countries. And that is the basis for the technology, it's the basis for policy, and it's fundamentally going to be impairing the robustness of our, of our technology and of our learning systems of the future. And I think that, for example, the, in the work that uh, I do, uh, we use citizen science, game-based citizen science, to allow the general public to contribute to different types of research questions and to more broadly understand how people all over the world solve types of problems. Uh, for example, individual problem solving in cognition, studying how humans uh, behave under different circumstances and uh, understand their visuospatial reasoning or their higher and executive cognitive functions, but also collectively, studying how human collective human behavior is different and from different cultures and different socio-scientific backgrounds. And I think that until we have that robust longitudinal studies of how people are behaving, that we will not be able to uh, inform uh, the data, the algorithms necessary for uh, the infrastructure uh, that Chris proposes. So I would like to then take this a little bit further and ask you, Jackson, you know, so being our da data guru, our AI guru, you know, how, how does data really, how can it really inform our decisions for the future? Uh, and you, you know, you've, you've been in various industries, obviously, but for, for education specifically. Yeah, and I'm just going to build off, uh, I think, the conversation Janet's starting with this idea that more information is not quality information. And you know, a lot of the really, really interesting insights come out of uh, data from around the world, looking at how you know, specific interactions, specific engagements um, uh, translate across borders and in different contexts and cross contexts, and how that information can then be uh, uh, presented to humans in a sort of back and forth interaction that I think Janet could talk more about. Um, to allow us to learn, you know, more interesting things. You know, I, I would probably focus on three main areas when I'm thinking about how data can specifically inform a future of education. Um, you know, I think one is is actually rather mundane, and this just comes down to the mundane sort of bureaucracy of records, record keeping, credits, credit systems. When we think about right now, you know, 
a lot of our education challenges, are, like I'm saying, rather mundane. I mean, you can look into the state of Washington, you can look at Arizona, and you can look at how, uh, you know, this is a kind of state's problem. Uh, students that go to community colleges and then would like to attend a four-year university have a remarkably difficult time translating the credits that they've earned at those community colleges into the four-year institutions, which is somewhat of a narrative that they've been promised. If you go to a community college, you'll be able to, you know, get your leg in the door and then, you know, advance from there. But then when they, you know, go to the community college, they hit this bureaucratic wall, which is these credits do not move, you know, in that upwards direction. And so, I mean, you know, looking into 2050, I think one of, you know, the moonshots, if you will, is to eliminate those kinds of frictions. I mean, I think it's absurd to be living, you know, in an area where uh, 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 real value that's being created, just because it's not being captured, uh, dissipates into the air, students end up dropping out, you know, in the tune of tens of thousands in the United States, and, uh, you know, lead less quality lives, you know, as a result of that. Um, I mean, I think similar, uh, you know, problems are in uh, sort of crisis and conflict area zones where you can see, uh, you know, credentials that, um, you know, are in paper form that, uh, you know, are on the, the wall of a home that gets burned down, you know, during that conflict, right? And so being able to move credentials across borders and having a reliable and sort of uh, 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 portfolio of learnings and skills that can survive, um, you know, especially as we see hundreds of thousands of climate refugees that are going to be happening. We need to be tearing down the borders around credentials and records. So, I mean, in terms of the, you know, the first, I think, data problem that we have is, again, mundane. It's record keeping and bureaucracy, putting it in the hands of students and learners so that they can own these records and have them with them no matter what country um, or what context they're in or you know, what district or school that they're in. Uh, you know, the, the second area that I think is really interesting is time. You know, time is one <laughs> that I, I don't think is it's the opposite of mundane. It's sort of <laughs> you know, up in the sky, pie, uh, you know, kind of looking, but it's to reevaluate our assumptions about when things happen when students are learning matters. Uh, there's lots of research that shows, you know, when a student takes a test uh, affects their test scores almost as much as a, a, a difference in parental incomes. And so, I mean, if a student takes a test at 9, you know, 9 a.m. instead of 3 p.m., and that drops them, you know, into an entirely different level of achievement, uh, just that means that the morning kids are going to be, you know, st stilted in a way that the afternoon kids are, and this just happens silently and passively in the background. You know, a, a mother that would like to take after, you know, uh, classes in between, you know, uh, uh, her job and taking care of her kid, if there's only a class at one specific time, she's unable to take that class, right? And so figuring out ways to make learning accessible across any time of the day um, and uh, 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 according to our heartbeats as opposed to our sort of watch, I think is going to be another, you know, big aspect of this. And so we'll continue to dig in, but I think time and uh, uh, record keeping are huge aspects of data. And you have some pretty interesting ideas about the concept of time, which I may, depending on our time today, may ask you. Uh, but let's go a little bit uh, in this concept of uh, time and space changing. Um, we're now required, we're now part of a generation here um, today um, that, is, that is always going to be learning. You know, we're lifelong learners. Whether, this is our gender. We're, we're expected to do that for the rest of our lives. We're gonna, you know, we were thinking of institutional, uh, institutional learning or, or university or school as this linear uh, transaction. And, and I say the word transaction deliberately, where you would go in, you would do your learning or your, uh, or your get your education, um, and then you'd get a diploma or a, accreditation, you'd pass the test, you go out, go into the workplace. But things have changed dramatically, and I'll ask uh, Manjula next, you know, uh, we're required to be lifelong learners because now instead of this linear transaction, we're seeing the zigzagging. We, we go in and out. We're also not going only to these spaces, these schools, these physical spaces that we know. We're also learning, um, uh, a foreign language on Duolingo, we're taking Coursera online, we're learning here today. I wonder if, um, if in the future this is part of my ledger or part of something that I could say I learned something new today and it's part of my, my lifelong learning uh, process. So how do we bridge that gap between um, what's happening in, in the early part of our education and then the workplace, you know, especially it, 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 as it comes to, to lifelong learning and what's coming with the, with the future of work? Yeah, I mean, 
so what the the challenges we have today in front of us uh, specifically when it comes to the sort of those who have been left behind how do we go from this sort of mass production of education like factory like schooling to personalized learning environments right um, and how do we t go from uh, sort of knowledge acquisition to knowledge application and it almost if you are stuck in the current definition of schooling you are not going to move out of that so we have to really think of how do we take school you know learning outside of schooling um, you know World Bank's last year's report of schooling doesn't mean learning anymore is a perfect example that this is a global realization now. But we are still stuck within the traditional definition of schooling for education. Uh, and in Sri Lanka, it's the same case. So in order to address that, what we sort of, uh, the approach that we've taken is to come up with sort of outside the system approaches and interventions by bringing in other key economic stakeholders into this. So the first thing that we did was to make education and learning equitable for everyone. So that means that they can go to the classroom and learn the sort of the academic knowledge. So we have this education financing platform through in the form of micro scholarships so that we, the students from secondary through higher education uh, don't have to drop out because of their gender circumstances or socioeconomic backgrounds. But we know that just going to school doesn't mean learning for today or not for future. But waiting for the government and the policymakers to change the relevance of education is not going to solve that. So we had to think out, outside the box. So we started working with the private sector, international community, other key economic stakeholders in providing a parallel pathway of learning outside the classroom, out after school programs, so that these students who come from less than $2 a day families would still have access to quality learning that everyone else globally from the global north is receiving. So that we can leapfrog the inequality and bring them uh, to not just have that academic degree or the qualification, but the, the competencies, the values, the skills that they're going to need to excel in work as well as in their lives. Um, I mean, uh, just a few days ago, there was a perfect example. Uh, this is a sort of an example to say that this is not just belong, th th this doesn't belong just for the Global South. Uh, we conducted this uh, workshop uh, for, uh, as part of the Doha Learning Days, and one of the teachers from South Africa who's teaching here was uh, sort of sharing her uh, experience of how she's in her 50s, and she feels that she cannot find a job at her age, but she feels that she has energy, experience, knowledge to contribute for the at least next 10 to 20 years. But she, there isn't a, an opportunity, there isn't a platform, there isn't a model out there for her to sort of unlearn and relearn. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's an issue across the globe. So we need to think of sort of out these outside interventions where we make schooling as we know to, uh, today irrelevant and go from this factory-like schooling to creating actual learning environments right. where anyone across the world at any place can learn. And that's what the, the, the beauty of you know, what Janet is doing and what learning economy is doing is bringing these technological sort of advancements that you can assign value to this type of learning. So that we, as implementers who are working at the grassroots, at the community level, can partner with them to make those learning uh, valuable so that those learners can benefit from that. Mm -hmm. So education is literally begging to be disrupted. <laughs> uh, Janet, I know you had Yeah, I just wanted to segue off of that. I actually had a question for Manjula too about <laughs> <laughs> that was the primary purpose uh, for, for taking the mic, uh, but I also, first want to comment that um, it seems like this example with the uh, with this woman this teacher here is twofold one is her um, 
attempt to try and understand what uh, the next level in her career would be. How do you get back in it and learn a new skill or um, transfer the skills that she already has into a new career? And I think uh, that's one component, but it also comes down to uh, the fundamental issue that she, like so many other people, are unable to quantify and uh, convey what these soft skills are, what these complex contextual nuanced skills are. And I think that that really lies uh, at the hands and um, in the, uh, at the job of researchers at this point to really delve into what these skills mean and what are the complexities of them, how, to what extent are they domain specific, and to what extent are they domain general. And uh, now it, the, the time is ripe for this research, and, and it's, it's uh, part of uh, my organization's research agenda, um, and I, but I think that it's uh, tangential to the necessity for the environments to relearn uh, skills. So I think they're both together. And then my question for you was, uh, what is the biggest success metric when you, you're talking about these case studies uh, where you have an outside of a school activity um, and uh, that it's been beneficial for others? Uh, what do you mean beneficial? When the students go into a company, what do they say we want this student because of X, Y, and Z? Great question, Janet. Thanks for asking that, actually, because uh, that's basically another way of saying what is our impact, right? Um, our impact is not, so impact is sort of multifaceted. Uh, you have this clear economic impact. Uh, our students' average household income increases tenfold by getting that higher education. So they are able to lift their entire families out of poverty. And that in itself is a huge impact. And that's how we started. When we started, we just wanted to get them out of that power cycle of poverty. But then we realized, wait a second, just coming out of poverty doesn't mean that they are ready for life. And we are seeing that in the society and globally today, we have significant number of educated people, academically educated people, who are part of big global issues. Mm -hmm. So that means something has been wrong with the education self, it's itself. So it doesn't mean education cannot be just for a job or an employment anymore. And that was the same issue in Sri Lanka. So then we started bringing these skills and the competencies and values, uh, things like social emotional learning skills, so that they have the ability to manage their own emotions, uh, become socially aware, have that emot emotional intelligence to contribute positively to the society, to their communities. And so in my, our case, a success means it's a, it's a lifelong journey. We measure what do they do after they get their jobs. Do they contribute back to the society? As part of our uh, sort of onboarding presen uh, process is that what the commitment that they make to, to the society, to their own communities. So when we measure our impact, we look at how our students doing uh, after graduate, uh, not just economic terms, but how do they volunteer back to their communities? Uh, some of them uh, you know, fund another student's education through our program. So they're giving back to their own communities. And these are the qualities that we instill in our students. And it's a lifelong journey. And we, we continue to monitor them. And if we can create a significant percentage of that within a society, we are going to start, others going to follow them. Uh, they are going to set examples for others as role models and, 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 and set examples of what a learner uh, and a member of a global society look like. So this is, thank you, Janet. See, that's how you know she's a good researcher. She's asking good questions. Um, so thank you for helping me there. Um, and I, and I'm, my other question, then maybe for Chris, for you, and then Jackson later, are we asking the right questions? Uh, because that, uh, that informs whether we're solving the right things for you. I would love for you to delve into that. And then in terms of measuring impact, um, is that something that we're doing right? And, it, and, it's, and maybe Jackson could comment on that. 
are we doing it right? Would, are we asking the right questions so that we can solve the right problems so then we can measure impact correctly? So maybe uh, the two of you can kind of dissect that question together. Yeah, you know, in terms of asking the right questions, that's always what they say, right? The answer's, uh, can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, the answers um, actually matter less than the questions. You know, it's really important we ask those. And, you know, and when I think about the questions that get asked of us, you know, uh, and you come and you begin thinking about specifically questions that can lead towards impact, you know, I really liked a lot of what you say. There is this idea of how do we measure impact? And I know for, you know, we meet with, you know, K through 12 schools and we meet with universities. Um, and, you know, for them, there is this idea, well, and you ask them, how do you measure impact? You know, in, in high schools, it's like, well, are they going on to college, right? In college, it's like, well, are they going on to have success, you know, after? Um, and I think, and I think the question that they're asking is, how do we measure impact? I think more importantly is it's, how do we stay connected with our students? Right, uh, because you can't really measure impact unless you know what's happened to the student, and I think that's always the hardest. It's like, well, we've got alumni network, and we try to have a survey that goes out, and they kind of let us know. But in truth, and this goes back to what Janet said about bad data, right? You, the data is terrible because the best data they have is just a little survey that they do every couple of years, and they're like, well, I guess my student got a job somewhere, so great, we did a good job. Uh, you know, I think that when you begin thinking about how you can do that and how you can you know, begin to measure this a little better. It goes back to something Jackson spoke about, which is, um, you know, there's a desperate need, I think, right now. Uh, and if I look towards 2050, uh, every student in 2050 has a universal learner portfolio, right? That is their own. It's a ledger. It's on something like a blockchain that has integrity and trust that can't be taken away. So you know, it's not going to burn down on a wall. You know, it doesn't. So no matter what happens, you know, social, political, economic, uh, you know, they have that. It always exists. It can never go away. And that learner record is something that has all of my, uh, you know, all of my learning and my transcripts and my grades from high school and also from college and the workshops that I did at libraries and panels like this and my internships. But it also goes further, and it's tracking. I got a job, and I got a raise, and I did workplace development, and you know, and I learned something on the job, and uh, I did courses on Coursera and on Khan Academy, and I learned a language on Duolingo. Uh, you know, I need that as a learner. If I have a unified portfolio of all of that, uh, and it not only is tracking my learning, but it's tracking my progress through the workplace, and it's doing this prenatal to death, right? Lifelong learning and lifelong you know, work, all of a sudden this beautiful data now in a very safe, aggregated way can go back and begin to quantify what we were talking about earlier. You know, what's the impact? We can start to look back and say, well, you know, what happened to my students uh, who were in high school and in college? Not only did they go on to get a job, but they went on and they changed the world and they did amazing things and they learned more, you know? And so I think this is really important, the question of, you know, how do we measure impact? I think it's better, how do we keep track of our students? Did you want to? I just have one thing. I think that it's not just measuring the impact, but understanding it. Yeah, uh, I, I, I want to take the 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 other uh, I don't know the other side of this question because I think there are kind of two questions that come up when we're talking about the future of education. This first one, which is. How do you measure the impact, right? Which is getting at, you know, what's the, what's the point? What's the goal? What, what's the outcome, if you will, of all of this thing that we call education? And I, I want to ask the second question, um, which is a little bit more about how we get there, which is when you normally talk about the future of education, people bring up personalized learning, individualized learning. And um, I want to unpack this because I sometimes fear, you know, that it's it's taken at um, sort of face value, you know, in a similar way that, you know, say Facebook um, personalizes your newsfeed, which is what what are the implicit assumptions of a world where we personalize all learning, where we make learning at an individual level, and I think if you unpack it, there. There are different meanings I think that people get at when they talk about personalization. One is meeting a student at where they're at, you know, understanding that there are certain barriers to a student achieving, you know, their educational outcomes and impact and sort of providing the resources. But there is also kind of this idea that we should, uh, uh, you know, serve education, you know, in a personalized way similar to the Facebook newsfeed, as in, uh, 
<laughs> you know, the, the, there was a, an example in Kansas, you know, which was Facebook's Moonshot Education, actually, where they actually created an entire school um, without teachers, um, where students sat looking at computers and the curriculum was personalized for them. And the problem was, is that after about a year and a half of this, um, it was sort of pronounced a profound failure. Uh, you know, kids were actually having seizures that were not previously having seizures, uh, and they were uh, not learning anything, right? And so, I mean, this idea that education should be solely personalized is a little bit, uh, I think, of a, a misleading notion. Now, I think, you know, a big piece of what we need to be looking at in terms of the future of education is how do we... Um, understand that tension between the individual and the collective? How do we understand that tension between, you know, what someone's individual goals for education are and what is our collective goal? Uh, you know, the goal of education is not necessarily to maximize, uh, you know, one person's flourishing. It's to maximize all of our flourishing. And learning itself is a deeply social activity. You can't learn without others around you. And so to understand when you're in a classroom, that classroom is more valuable if you are invested in the other people around you. If you are there as a consumer of education to sort of you know, extract knowledge you know, from your peers, you're learning the wrong lesson. You are learning something, but you aren't learning uh, uh, necessarily what I would consider to lead to a more flourishing life and flourishing society. And so, you know, when I come back to the, the right questions, it's what do we mean by personalizing education? And are we personalizing it at the Facebook engagement level or are we, you know, tailoring it to meet them at where they're at? And how does that relate to the question of what is impact? Do you want us to answer it? I'm <laughs> Keep that in your mind. It might be something that you want to comment on when we start our Q&A. Uh, but maybe, Jana, you can talk a little bit about that because we talk about personalized learning and uh, at the end of the day, what that means is algorithms, basically. So how do we, um, how do we build algorithms that, for the future that are not flawed the way Jack Sony is explaining, or they do work, because we are talking about science fiction moonshot right now. You know, let's go back to this grand idea. What, is, what does that look like from a perspective of someone who works in that intersection of, of research and technology and education? Yeah, so I, I just want to clarify one thing, that um, personalization isn't synonymous with large-scale algorithms. You can have personalized education for an individual child that's been developed by an individual teacher. We're talking about how to take that personalization on a much scalable uh, perspective um, and to level that inequity also because it, it relies very heavily, a personalization requires v relies very heavily at this point on having a very qualified teacher or educator to make that for you. So I think that uh, the discussion about uh, personalized education on a scalable level, uh, of course, will rely on algorithms, but it will also rely on a, a much deeper understanding of uh, the human and the cognitive level, because the personalization that we're discussing um, currently uh, relies on things, uh, general information about where is the person located, uh, what has their, their past test scores been, uh, what are their personal feedback responses when they answer a survey. It's that type of information that uh, tends to, um, to draw on a modular system. So then based on what they answer, based on where they are, the language, then you can uh, select different modules that allow someone to move at their own pace. But for me, I see personalized education of the future to be much more adapted to someone's underlying cognitive abilities. So you have a student, and uh, based on uh, their information, on their visuospatial reasoning, their response inhibition, their persistence, the information is presented to them in a way in which they can grow over time. And that will be a combination of both uh, algorithmic or game-based or computer-based modules, but as well as uh, guiding them as to the best way to understand that information with their teacher, with their caretaker, with their learner, and uh, in their physical environment as well. So this is a, a perfect example of right intention, you know, when and what Jackson was mentioning with Facebook, right intention wrong outcome or wrong result. So when we talk about, you know, this is our time right now. Um, when we talk about Moonshot of Education, 
we all have the right intentions. There's no question about that. Everyone in this area right here has the right intention. So, but how do we get to those results? What, 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 what are the right steps uh, to, to get the results we desire? So from your perspective, Chris, um, I know that you've started with research. You sort of like, we're a research first organization. What are, why research and then what's next? Yeah, it's a good question. And I'll say this, you know, uh, for Janet's benefit, uh, you know, we say we're research. We're not research in the sense that Janet is research, right? Uh, we, uh, we do pioneering research, you know, we, we figure out how to do new things. We work with Saying mine isn't pioneering, Chris? Well, no, I, that's fair, that's fair. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, generally research is, you know, it's very heavy. You go through it, you peer review, you spend a lot of time, you know, getting into it. We, we move pretty quickly with our research, you know, and we look at, at new models and, you know, we do pilots and we get out there and, and we iterate. It's, it's a little different. It, and, that's, and, and that's actually, I say that to say it's probably less impactful as the kind of, of, of research that she does. But what it gives us the ability to do is to qualify models, to understand what works and what doesn't, and then we can move quickly and we can, we can develop new things. Um, and so when you think about how that plays into this, you know, it's like this. Whenever, when we started, you know, two years ago, we thought maybe we were, well, we were going to build applications, right? Uh, what we learned over the course of, you know, two years of research and study and pilots was really we were in the infrastructure business, right? And when you're doing infrastructure upgrades and you're thinking about impacting uh, people on a national and a global scale, which is really what that means, it, when you don't do research, you, it's very uh, unwise, right? Because there's a lot of people's lives that get impacted. And, uh, and what we have seen, you know, through taking that time and working with the stakeholders, asking ho uh, hopefully the right questions, uh, what we have seen is that there is a collective need uh, to solve these problems, you know? I mean, there are obviously nuanced problems in localized places that are different. But across the globe, there are very standard problems, right? Uh, interoperability does not exist between systems, right? Like fragmentation is an issue. Uh, skills gaps are happening every single place on the earth. Um, you know, opportunity gaps are growing. Uh, collaboration gaps are growing. Um, and so for us, you know, when you look at that, where does it begin, right? It begins with human capital investment, I think. Actually, I think at the root of it is the supply chain being fragmented, but I think that where these problems really uh, become uh, remarkably um, scaled and, and the gaps begin to grow, it happens because the human capital investors, like governments, like institutions, are making guesses, right? They're doing their best to do research. This is why I kind of prefaced the way that I did. They're using the best research that's available, but the research actually isn't... Uh, coming from live information. It's coming from old information or bad data a lot of times. And what, what you really need when it comes to human capital investors, you know, they're making guesses. They're investing into what they think the best education should be. Uh, and then they go all in on that, right? And they invest into this legacy system and the gaps grow and they grow and they grow because they aren't getting feedback to say, wait, this isn't working. And so I, I really think it's critical, and what we've seen through you know, our research uh, is that there is a real need for this live data feedback. You know, imagine a world in 2050 in which uh, a human capital investor, a government, an institution has a dashboard, right? And on this dashboard, they have real-time information that's saying, here are the skills that our schools are creating, one by one. Here are the skills that our teachers are producing. Here are the skills our students have. Here are the skills that our workplace need. And then we as humans can use our ability for pattern recognition to see where the gaps are in real time. And we can say, well, we're doing great at computer science skills, but we're in desperate need of budgeting skills and no one's producing that, right? But then they can say, well, hold on though. There is a school here in the Northwest that is doing a great job at this. And they should be able to look immediately right into the ledger and say, how are they doing this? Ah, okay, and then copy, paste, and measurably scale these modules and these approaches to measurably solve a skills gap. And I think this is really important, and I think it is part research, but I think it's also implementation. You need both research and action hand in hand to really qualify, is the research producing impact, is the research right or not, if that makes sense. So we only have a few minutes. I have two more quick questions, and then I'm gonna open it up, and I would love your comments and, and questions as well. Um, Manjula, for you, and then Jackson, you you both mentioned interesting things that I'd like to just dive a little bit deeper. So make maybe your answers quick so we can get to the, to the audience. Um, for you, Manjula, we talked about 
talent, global, the skills gap and talent mobility, and obviously we're talking about big ideas and moonshots. What we know right now, uh, Oxford University has come up with uh, some interesting research that shows that um, in the global south and, and, and emerging economies like India, Brazil, China, what we're looking at is um, a, a high level of, of skilled workers for what we're going to call what we're calling jobs of the future, or the, the jobs we're going to need by 2050. And we're looking at, other, at countries like North America and, and Northern Europe, where and you know, there's skills mismatches. So there's available jobs, but there's not enough. Uh, skilled workers. So we have managed to completely break down every barrier we can with communications and advent of internet and mass connectivity and all of that. We now travel at this you know, amazing speed to connect with each other. Um, but we have physical barriers that are very real. I'm not going to get into the politics of that. But I can't just easily, um, by 2020, just bring all of the workers that I need, the skilled workers that I need. And this is a real um, part of the inequity question. And, and the reason that I brought you into this, Jackson, as well, is because there's a, a, an identity connection there as well. So, so there's uh, this verifiable need around the world for people to have uh, identity um, to, to have their identity recognized, uh, where well, they have their skill, they have the skills, but they don't even sometimes have um, an ID. So, think of you know, there's no barriers to what we can do. This is you're running on a platform. If someone votes for you and for you, this is how you fix it. How do we fix these two issues? Do we just break down all of the borders, no more visas, or do we do we have the technology to have everybody ID'd and and travel wherever they need to to work? Well, I, I think, um, again, going back to sort of the, uh, how do we take these interventions to the, to the sort of the grassroots, to the, uh, uh, to the actual communities where these students haven't had the opportunity yet. Uh, so it's, I think it's, uh, there are multiple ways of doing that, but it's, it's the intention of democratizing those opportunities. And if you, unlock, you can unlock their potential if you create opportunities for them. And that's what we do. And it's not about who we partner with or what type of technology we use or what type of platform we use. Our goal is to create a pathway of opportunities that are accessible, that, pro that would provide them with equitable and, and inclusive relevant learning environment so that they could realize their potential. And, and for us, there are multiple ways of doing it. You know, we have global partnerships where our students travel to US and we bring US students to Sri Lanka and provide them that opportunity to understand each other, learn from each other. We bring private sector employers, both multinationals and local level employers and private sector to invest in the pipeline of talent uh, and, and expose them, mentor them, train them, and eventually hire them. Um, so there are multiple ways of doing that. It's, it's about having that vision, having a platform, and then actually implementing it, and then using technology and these tools to really amplify that effort so that it, it can be scaled, it can be replicated in other places, so that it becomes universal, so that we can bring those you know, millions of people who have been left behind to the current level so that when we moonshot for education, we all go together other, you know, rather than just get into 2050 and having another conversation, how do we bring everyone who we, we left behind now? How do we close the gap? Right, exactly. So there shouldn't be a gap when, in 2050. So if you have all the resources in place, we need to make sure how do we go there together that applies for everyone, not for one part of the population or, 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 or the ones who are privileged to have those opportunities. Right. And then Jackson, is there, how does technology help us achieve that? Yeah, uh, technology can either help us or it can absolutely uh, make this a much more, uh, much larger quagmire. Uh, I mean, when it comes to, you know, learning and everything, a lot of the things we've been talking about, um, you know, identity is an incredibly important issue. It's another one of these boring sort of mundane issues, uh, you know, for a large part of the world, but also one of the more life or death issues uh, that exists. Uh, I mean, you know, in, in the States, 
when you say identity, lots of people, you know, vaguely think about Equifax scandals. They think about, you know, this big, you know, these big three large companies that for some reason own everything about you and get to decide if you can, you know, take out credit or, you know, uh, 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 apply for education, you know, apply for a job, et cetera, all of these kind of things. Uh, but for the vast majority of the world, there is no stable form of identity. And so it's kind of a mess in both places. And, you know, when it comes to learning, uh, learner identity, you know, all these kind of things. It's about proving who you are, what you've learned, what skills you have, and, you know, this how allows you to uh, uh, um, apply for jobs. This allows you to take out, you know, loans and all these kind of important capacities. And so I think identity is one of these issues that gets sort of swept under the rug um, for people who have an identity. It's an especially easy one to sort of gloss over. Uh, and so an important, you know, speaking to Manjula's point, you know, thing that needs to be urgently considered is how do we ensure that everyone has access to identity, but an identity that is not coercive, that is not, uh, you know, controlled by uh, someone that has opposing interests to that person. You know, if you are a, uh, you know, if you, you know, just to take a simple example, if you are Rohingya in Myanmar, you know, just be, having access to an identity through your government is not necessarily the best option. And so, you know, we need to create systems that do exist and is possible right now that I think can be championed by libraries in some countries um, that can actually empower people to have an identity that they own, that they control, and that they can use anywhere in the world. That is transferable. And I know we're moving on, but let me just... What the, what, if you have a note and you want to know more about identity and technologies that will empower this, the technology that will make this possible is called self-sovereign identity. SSI, it's a blockchain solution where you own your identity. So if you want to know more about it, look that up. Fantastic. Um, it, yes. So just uh, call on me. I'm going to walk around. And I know we have someone to help us with this. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, feel free to also comment and let us know who you are, too. Yep. Hi, my name is Akash, and I work in India on uh, lifelong learning, uh, especially for the school-to-work transition. Um, with state governments and, and educators and so on. So I think the question and, and listening to some of the conversations, what brings up is that we are all aligned to this goal of lifelong learning, uh, but um, and, and the question of impact and, and how do we really know whether we are making a difference uh, or whether we are on the path to making a difference is what I'm hearing. So the question is really what are some of the intermediate outcomes? That we are looking at long-term impact, but we need to know if we are really building or creating lifelong learners, there are some intermediate impact indicators. If, if you sort of stumbled upon them in, in, in the work that you do, uh, that's something that's just of interest to me to, to understand what, how do we know we are on the path because it really needs some new learning behaviors, learning skills, and, and, and that's something I'm interested in, in, in learning more about. So is this a question for the whole panel or someone specifically? Who wants to take it? Okay. Uh, so, so for my my research studies show that um, when you can understand skill transfer, you have a, a deeper um, connection between the learning whether the learning processes are working. So, how skills transfer uh, in intra domains so moving from one for example one type of engineering to another type of engineering uh, so that's relatively uh, within the same domain can you transfer your skills your abilities um, uh, both hard and soft uh, into a new job and the second is uh, in intra domain domain so moving for example from an engineer to a social worker or moving from um, a, a doctor uh, to a entrepreneur um, how uh, how much do those do your skills transfer? And we're just starting uh, to scratch the surface on research in that, but I think that it'll be a key indicator as to whether or not uh, we're moving in the right direction for that lifelong learning. I would just add on the sort of uh, more on the um, how do we measure beyond just jobs and skills? Um, it's you know we track uh, even while they are learners while they're students, uh, how they contribute back, a number of hours they volunteer, uh, whether they mentor, uh, whether they engage in their communities, whether they give back. Um, so those are some of the sort of uh, intermediate uh, measures that we sort of track our students uh, during their journey while as a learner. 
and then also when they graduate and you know it just goes beyond just uh, doing a job and getting a, an income or going to sort of getting a promotion etc but how much engagement they have with the outside world uh, whether it's through our own organization or their communities or at a very uh, larger scale uh, you know as a change maker in the society and we have also and then we'll go to you in a minute yeah Hello, my name is Ling and I'm 16 years old, so I'm currently still a high school student. So my question also about lifelong learning, and um, in this kind of world there are like different flows of information, there can be facts, there can be opinions, there can be fake facts. And I'm very interested about data information, so my question is how can we utilize data information to foster lifelong learning and also inspire young people to be not only active consumer of information but also to be producer of it? Who would like to take this? <laughs> uh, so weird. Um, wonderful question. Uh, you know, I, I think you know. Really, to kind of take a step back, I think this is really interesting uh, to, to to ask this question about consumers of, of information and producers of information, uh, particularly because I think it's born out of a world uh, consumed by the internet right now. Right? I mean, when the internet arrived, everyone you know was very excited about it. It's going to be the most democratizing force in the world. It's going to you know make everything better. You know, et cetera, et cetera. And the problem is we haven't seen that. And what we have seen is an ab absolutely you know, deluge of information without really any sort of proxies for understanding what's valuable inside of that, right? And so the current, there, there are incentives to produce information right now, and they're largely tied to advertising and egos and sensationalism, right? And so all of the normal ways that we would associate with value are broken because they're sort of channeled all, you know, through these you know, couple, you know, handful of, of, of mechanisms. And incentives, and so you know, a lot of the work that we're all working on is looking at how we can add, you know, different value layers to the internet. Um, you know, I think in terms of symbols, you know, I think the dollar is a symbol. I think euros are a symbol. I think pesos are a symbol. You know, I also think things like votes are a symbol. And inside of these symbols are a particular logic, right? You know, inside of a vote, you have, you know, uh, you know democratic votes, you know, one person, one vote. Uh, you can't transfer your vote, you can't sell your vote, et cetera, right? And so the, the, the vote itself is a symbol that because of its logic gains this deep and profound meaning. You know, you can create, uh, you know, an election and because of the symbol on top of that and because you have elections, you can create democracies. You know, I think similarly, you know, I like to talk about time, you have the clock, which has this sort of cosmic, you know, sort of uh, uh, logic of always advancing forward. And so similarly, I think, you know, when it comes to learning and knowledge and truth and news, if we can come up with new symbols that represent new logics that we don't yet have proxies for, we can actually add this value layer back to the internet. So when it comes to, let's say, news, for example, I think you could add, uh, uh, you know, a symbol that measures thoughtfulness. Right? And if you can actually reward thoughtfulness and you can have people that come into common agreement around what is thoughtful and what's not thoughtful, you could actually pierce the deluge of information by um, allowing communities that come around this shared agreement to reward whoever is most upholding that sort of intrinsic value. And so anyway, if you want to talk about that more afterwards, we can talk about it for hours, but really good question. Okay. Uh, hello, my name's Neil. I've been a school principal. I'm living all these changes. I've got a quick observation and a quick problem which together make a question. The first of all, the observation is, I am one of the very few people who watched the success of the moonshot. I remember watching it landing and it happening, watching it with amazement as a child. The second time, a few months later, when they went there the next time, I sat there watching on the television with my great-grandmother who was born in 1884 and she watched it happen. Now, what I always wanted to think is that transformational sweep of change. The next observation, I'm not sure it's a good analogy because it was a fantastic goal. It was achieved, and then by 1972, we've never been back, you know, and it's been passed and we never did it. So the next thing is the living of these changes from my job role, which is actually in managing a school and a school system, the problem, which we've not discussed here, is the authorizing environment and power and the fact that the administrative systems and audit systems that I'm working in are not co cognitively resonant with what you're talking about. And that is the problem that I need to overcome. 
a good question. Yeah, you know, and I don't, I don't know if this addresses it directly, but uh, it seems to me what you're saying is there's incentives that are out of line. Is that the idea? I mean, and I think that this is a real, real problem. And we probably don't, I know we're running out of time. We don't have a lot of time to unpack this, but I would urge you to go and look something up called the Trusted Learner Network. This is something that's being pioneered uh, at ASU, uh, but it's, it's starting to spread across the United States. Uh, the idea is how do we uh, rethink, in many ways, the incentives of the institutions uh, to bring a bit of sovereignty back to the students, and how do we create kind of co-models where maybe the student and the institution own the records together, right? And, and these types of things, and I, I think, you know, a lot of our research is very much grounded in Let's look at all those stakeholders we talked about. Let's find out what their incentives are. Let's find out where they uh, don't match up and let's realign them. And I, and I think that the Trusted Learner Network really is a, is a powerful, they have 12 different approaches to realign the incentives of the institutions with the students. Uh, and I think you'll find a lot of value in that. Do we have, how much more time do we have? have one, no? One more, we'll take one more. This is what you do, and you give me too much power with this. <laughs> uh, a little closer. The mic is not working. How about we give another? Uh, where again uh, in line of that's when not a little bit uh, resonant I'm young enough like gentlemen over there yeah <laughs> okay. the point is just to make it sure, short the outcome of those managing the industries are the same outcomes of those managing the education sector so how come is the industry is leading in terms of the demands on the skills where the education system is lagging on uh, supplying the demands to the, to, to, to the, uh, to, to the industries. This, this is where, where I, li uh, I, I liked your, uh, uh, the approach you have put it, that the supply chain, or the, the, the value chain already, uh, already there. So my question again, okay, how it comes that there is a lagging in the skills demand where the, the outcomes of those Two, uh, two different sectors or education sectors and the others are the same. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is how do you align those to make them the same? No. Or why are, they, how, yes. why are they separate? How, how comes that they are different where the outcomes of those education systems yeah. Both of them coming from the same education system anyway. Yeah, well, I mean, and I think, and it goes back to this is, I mean, I think I could be wrong, but I think this is the skills gap, right? This is very specifically what's happening. You know, the, the World Bank uh, did a, World Bank and I think Hilton did a human capital report. yeah the human capital report where they went through and they analyzed this exact question like what are the outcomes that the schools are creating what are the skills that the workplace need and where is the gaps and it turns out every single city every single nation across the world is experiencing this so why well again I go back and I believe and we believe that uh, the reason this happens is because the data is very bad for the people who are investing in the education and who are saying, here's what you should educate, right? Because they're making guesses. And this is another thing. One of the big reasons is because of progress, right? Maybe when I invested in that education, it was the right education, but three years later, it was the wrong education because the jobs and the skills that the world need are changing so, so rapidly. And so up until now, the data that human capital investors have had to invest uh, or to qualify and benchmark their investments has very much been built out of old data. And so we need real live data. And the reason that it happens is because people guess in how they invest and we need to stop guessing. We need to actually qualify our investments based on real data that we know is making impact. I, we're actually, now I'm gonna get in trouble. <laughs> okay, I wanna thank you so much for playing with us today. Um, and I, if you have any questions, you wanna get to know the panelists a little bit more. We'll stay around. So thank you again for your attention, and um, we'll see you next time. <laughs>